okay, let's uh, let's start. Uh, so it's uh, a really big pleasure to have Agla uh, here. Uh, we have known him uh, for quite a while, but this is the first time that he comes to the university. Uh, he was at least uh, last December, but uh, that's the year he came. And now uh, they are uh, participating at Sonar. Uh, in fact, uh, I see that Google has a, quite a big presence at, at Sonar from uh, different teams. And uh, clearly, Magenta is one of the uh, Research projects uh, from Google that uh, he uh, directs that has uh, attracted quite a bit of attention in the, in the recently on the using of deep learning for, for music. So it's great to have uh, the leader of the team to be here and to talk uh, about that. So, yeah, I guess quite a number of people are uh, also at Sonar, so I guess you gave a similar talk Very short. Uh, in, uh, at Sonar. But, uh, Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. You guys have, I didn't know how beautiful the university is here. I mean, Barcelona, is, you guys, it's the best city in, in Europe for sure. So somehow we're going to find a way to, to spend a lot of time here. It's really great. Um, so the, the project I'm going to talk about today is called Magenta. And it was just an acronym, Music and Art Generation. Um, and the goal is actually, um, you've probably, if, if you're in this field, you may have seen articles and PR and press around this. And, and maybe there's a little bit too much. I mean, our, our goals are really pretty modest um, and I think very well aligned with what you're all doing here, which is simply to try to understand what we can do with, with generative models um, uh, in machine learning to, to generate uh, media. So we talk about it in terms of music and art, but another way to think about this is, um, you know, I have two kids, um, 13 and 18, and I watch what they do with, with these, with their phones. And largely, they're information seeking, uh, they're communicating, and they're looking for entertainment. And so, you know, these really have, even though we're not talking on phones, they've remained fundamentally communication devices. They're about communicating. And um, if you think about what we're doing as musicians and as artists, we're also communicating. And so I think, I think we have an opportunity with, with machine learning, with especially the same kinds of models that we use for translation and that we use for speech recognition, that same family of models, to, to also um, provide ourselves with new tools for communication. Um, in this Venn diagram, there remains this, this, this very important component, which is human creativity and feedback. I, I, I personally don't think it's very interesting to talk about um, pushing a button and watching a computer make art. I mean, I think, it's, I think we want machine learning models to be strong and, and, and to do interesting things. That's what, makes, that's what would make this technology interesting. But fundamentally, I think, I hope we all agree that, that art and, and music are about communicating with other people, maybe convincing them of something, maybe showing them something new. Um, and so the, the, the idea of having one computer play music for another computer is, is great as a thought experiment, but it's not what interests us on Magenta. Furthermore, um, <laughs> let's be really honest, we, we don't know what makes good art and what makes good music. Um, that's true for us as musicians and as artists, right? You kind of wait <laughs> to see if you suck or not, and if people like you, maybe you don't, right? So there's this longer-term goal, which we haven't, really, um, we haven't really reached, which is, you know, once we have some models that do okay, can we use reinforcement learning or other kinds of critical feedback to make them better? And then the, 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 the combinations of, of people and technology that work are the ones that other people like. Not everybody, right? But you hope that you have some small slice of people that love what's happening and that they continue to come back for more. And, and that's really long term. I think that's the only kind of success you can hope for um, is that there's um, engagement with, with other people and, a and some sort of conversation that happens over time. Um, we are open source. And um, I think you know, we're always very actively looking for collaborators, um, especially you know, like we have a blog. We, you know, we, we've had lots of guest blogs. We're not really trying to keep this as a closed community at all. And I, I think there's a future, there's a future that we haven't reached yet that is not really just Magenta, but it's a number of projects happening in parallel where I strongly believe we'll continue to see growth of coding as a creative, as a creative um, tool itself. So it's not that the engineers create stuff with code and then throw it over a wall and then musicians grab that code and they do something creative with it. I mean, I mean obviously creative coding has been around for a long time and this is a, a hotbed of, of, of of that and all the MIR stuff. So I'm speaking uh, hopefully to people who agree, but this idea that we might start to 
in large open source to be part of the toolkit of like musicians and artists who actually want to code a little bit is something I'd love to see happen. I want to talk about two projects. Um, they're not both music, actually. The first one's drawing. Um, but I think it still, it still tells a story about what we might be able to do with generative models. Um, this is a paper that um, the first author is David Ha. He's a, a brain resident, um, which is a one-year program in Google Brain in, Mont in uh, um, <coughs> Mountain View, where, where I work. Um, highly recommend to all of you to consider a next round of brain residency. It's basically a one-year postdoc um, working with a bunch of deep learning researchers. Um, and then some convert, stay to Google, some move on to grad school. You don't have to have a PhD to do this. Um, anyway, the basic idea of SketchRNN was to explore the space of drawings, and specifically the space of um, sketches, not, not pixels. The model is trained on the delta x and y of a bunch of sketches, um, and then it learns to generate new instances. So these are all instances of, of, of cats. Actually, it's moving through the latent space, um, so moving from one to another of, of cats and yoga and fire trucks and mosquitoes. And um, maybe some of you are familiar with, uh, how many of you have seen Quick Draw? Okay, that's cool, a few of you. So um, the data that we, we use came from this kind of cute game that Creative Lab from Google put out where you're trying to uh, play Pictionary against a computer. The computer is actually uh, an image classifier um, trained on ImageNet. And there's a clever trick to this. This is a really clever trick to this. So you're drawing, you know, and it's, you know, you're told to draw a bear, and then you draw this, and then sometimes you get it right and you get points. It turns out that like you might think that you that was that, to get those points, you um, the the classifier thought that the number one answer was bear, but it turns out you just if bear shows up in the top five, you run with it, and people love that, right? So, you know, we don't we not really have to care about retrieval here and and. Uh, Balancing precision, we just grab something from the top five, and people love people love it. So we start to collect um, millions of drawings, and um, as you may know, they we we just released these drawings out into open source. So they're you know hundreds of millions of drawings. They have the constraint that they were drawn in less than 20 seconds by anybody, so the artistic quality may be low, right? But they're still interesting. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about this generative model for vector images because I think it it tells an interesting story. Um, for some of you, this will go too slow um, in terms of the machine learning, but for others of you, maybe it will be useful. Um, the basic idea in a generative model is that we're going to um, come up with some representation of the data that will allow us to later sample from that representation, sample numerically um, and uh, stochastically. In this case, we're going to talk about a generative model that functions as an autoencoder. So, um, oh. Well, that's interesting. Did I grab, hold on. Oh, right. Sorry. I'm going to, because I just didn't get a chance to switch slide decks. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip some of this stuff. OK, so this is in a different order. I, I really apologize for this. Um, how am I going to fix this? This was my slide deck for you guys. You know what? You're just going to see the, dirty, the, dirty, the dirtiness of going back, back and forth. OK. Um, it's relatively informal. It is now. Um, <laughs> it wasn't before. It's just the chunks are in different orders for different talks. Um, it, it really, I, did, I do know what the slide deck is supposed to do. So um, we have um, some input and some output that is um, specifically uh, the, first, the first time the user touches the screen on a phone or uses their mouse to start the drawing. That's 0, 0. That's the origin. And all that we're storing are delta x, delta y. Um, to, to create the strokes. Um, there's something clever and interesting about even this, this particular image. Notice that the cat input, that's a real input drawn by, by David, has actually been run through a trained model and decoded. And notice the difference between the two drawings. Um, the, 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 uh, the latent space actually added a whisker that wasn't there before, um, which we'll come back to. Our encoder. Um, which is just the technical term for taking the data in the, in the, in the, in the space of the, of the raw data and projecting it into our latent space, um, is a bidirectional recurrent neural network. So it's an LSTM that um, is moving um, both ways through the, the set of delta x, delta y's, starting at the end and coming through to the beginning, coming from the beginning, going through to the end. This is a common tactic for um, doing non-causal processing over sequences. Obviously, you'll need to have the whole drawing because we, we're going both ways through it to do this. Um, and this is similar, actually, to work done by Alex Graves, now at DeepMind, um, 
on handwriting generation. So this basic idea was there. Um, we're then um, creating a rather, rather restricted latent space, Z, um, into which we're injecting some noise to avoid overfitting. And, uh, and our cost that we're training on is a combination of L2 and um, KL divergence. So we're trying to model the entire, the entire space of possible drawings, not just the points of data on which real drawings live. Okay, so it'll allow us to generalize later. And our decoder is a unidirectional LSTM, um, so a recurrent neural network. And um, it unfolds in time and tries to predict the outputs of the drawings. But crucially, it has tied onto it a, a small uh, mixture of Gaussian's model, which was the, if any of you paid attention to the starting slide, maybe you didn't, it looks like little rose petals. Uh, I, I'm not going to go back through 50 slides to get there. The basic idea is that um, this RNN is trying to, um, is also propagating through this mixture of Gaussians, which allows it to model really nicely, given the number of Gaussians in the mixture, the multimodal, um, the multimodal behavior that you see from these drawings. And of course, this is unidirectional, right? So we're not, now we're going to actually spin out these drawings in, in real time. And uh, again, I really do, we've seen some interesting um, work already being done artistically with QuickDraw, um, just the, the raw data. And we have in open source the, um, the code for training these models and playing around. I want to do a quick demo of this for you that I think, um, let's see how we're doing on our Zoom here. So um, what I'm going to do is start to draw, and that's going to um, condition the model. And then the model is going to continue drawing, um, but it's going to sample um, nine different times. So you get to kind of get an idea of the variance of the model. So this, this model was trained only on cats. And if I draw some cat ears, then, oh, see, I get rain. Never mind. OK. This is a bug. This is, this, this is like a, it's a janky JavaScript demo that we're cleaning up. So let's just go with rain. Um, if I draw clouds, right, then the model knows that, that it rains, right? And it, notice, I, if I draw clouds, I get rain, right? Because it turns out most people, when they want to win at this game, they draw the cloud first. If I draw rain first, I almost never will get a cloud. So if I draw rain, if I draw big raindrops, this, the model's going to, that one, added, oh, that's kind of cool. I did the raindrop backwards for the first time ever. And now I'll do the raindrop this way. It matter, the, the direction matters, right? Do the raindrops that way, and I get more raindrops, OK? And sometimes a cloud. And if I add raindrops um, that are just coming down like that, the model kind of tends to add in similar raindrops. So it's just toy data, right? These things are just made in 20 seconds. But I think there's something. Um, for me, at least, I'm drawn intellectually to, to this idea of what kind of expressivity do we get when we live in the space of strokes instead of pixels, and what kind of expressivity do we get when we live in the space of sequenced strokes so that the order starts to matter. Um, I also, there's, um, we're going to release some of this very soon um, to play with, but like, I can't really draw a cruise ship, so I'll just draw some water. And the model will just draw in the cruise ships for me, which I think is so cool. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, this also might, in your mind, form the kernel of, of directions for having a machine learning able to kind of complete your thoughts for you. Like, this is not very interesting if what you do is just push a button and see a bunch of cruise ships. But it's really interesting if you can kind of tilt the generation, or maybe you can see the possible futures from what you've already drawn, right? Like, you start something, and then it gives you some, some directions forward. Huh, which talk do I pick? There are so many. Let's go with Zurich. Let's go back to Zurich, whatever. Right now, we're in Barcelona, but I was recently in Zurich. Um, we also have this idea of temperature, um, which is common in these models. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, when you sample from the, the softmax probability distribution, um, if it's very spiky, you're going to tend to only land on that one mode of, of the distribution that it's learned. So you can um, numerically um, kind of flatten out the distribution, changing the, the, sort of the, the entropy content in the distribution. And as you go hotter, the, the entropy changes such that you know, this is, I really love these yoga drawings, like the low temperature yoga, the really predictable ones, like, you know, we can all kind of do, right? Um, but as hot yoga um, comes in, it gets much more difficult <laughs> to imagine. <laughs> and they're actually quite fun. Um, these were just blown up from these down here. Um, also, those, those were unconditional generations, which means um, we're, we're, we only, whoops, we only use the decoder. We just decode from our latent representation. Um, but we can also, prime our latent representation by encoding something. So in this case, we've encoded um, four faces. 
And then just so you can see them, those are the reconstructions from the decoder as we sample from these corners. Okay? And each of these four faces are shown in the corners. And now we're moving through our latent space. And what you'll see is that in, we don't have any spaces, we don't have any points in this particular area of the latent space that are broken, which um, if we only train on L2, if we only train on, on Euclidean distance, we actually have lots of points in the space which are broken because the model only learns where the data is. So we're also training on KL divergence as well, so forcing the model to also kind of understand the, the overall space. And that's crucial for getting this kind of smooth behavior um, in, in latent space. <coughs> also, um, I think interesting, these models don't memorize. We've purposely kept the capacity of the generative model small. Otherwise, it's kind of boring, right? It just memorizes. And we also inject a little bit of noise because th there's these, these vector drawings are really low dimensional. You just basically have a column of XY deltas, and you might have just 50 or 100 of them, and that's it. So it's really easy to overfit. Um, so if you notice, this, the model on the left, the left-hand column was trained on cats. And you see if you encode something, that's the brown, the model decodes more or less what you've encoded. Obviously not exactly what you've encoded, because it's not got that much capacity. Um, here's a model trained only on pigs. Notice if you give, a, give it a pig with eight legs, the decoder actually only reproduces four of them, which I call a, a feature, not a bug. I think that's kind of nice, that it, it has this really strong prior towards um, this particular geometry. Um, and I, I love this. If you, if you take a truck and you, you run it through the pig model, right, you get a pig truck. Right? And, and um, I'm sorry if you hear me repeat this, because I, I use this example at Sonar, but I, I defy you to draw a better pig truck than that. It's like someone just comes to you and says, like, draw a pig that looks like a truck or draw a truck that looks like a pig. Like, like, like it's pretty good, right? Like, it's kind of got truckness in the front and pigness in the back. Um, there are no three-eyed cats uh, in the model's mind. And um, more crucially, in terms of memorization, if you give it something that we recognize, like a, like a nice iconic view of a toothbrush, it's so far away from cat that the model just can't reproduce it at all. So I definitely think that's good, right? This particular model has, this is the cat model. This model has learned about cats. And now we're working towards conditional models that can learn thousands of classes at the same time. Um, what's in our paper now are learning a few classes um, at the same time and having multiple single class models. Um, finally, um, <clears throat> for those of you that like, so this is vector algebra in the latent space, but just, just look at it. Like, like it does what it's supposed to, right? The, the algebra of pig and cat body and faces holds in this model. So I think that's, that shows some, some real smoothness, some sense that, that we've learned a kind of smoothness in this space. OK, I'm going to move on to music. This is um, definitely a music group. But I thought that, that the drawing stuff was interesting. I think it does overlap enough with what we're trying to do with music sequences that it's worth talking about. Um, I'm going to grab a couple of, of small, um, actually, no, what I'm going to do is go to Ensynth. This is not, this is, sorry, me going in the wrong order. So. Don't look at those slides. Don't look. OK, now look. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is a project um, learning a music synthesizer using uh, deep neural networks. This is about timbre. It's about sound. And um, we also published um, some data to go with this that people can play with. Um, this is a, a nice collaboration between Brain in Mountain View and the DeepMind team in London. And um, I can say that even within a company like Google, it's really hard to collaborate over nine time zones. Like it just takes, and it's, it's easy enough for like manager types to be like, hey, you shall collaborate. I just looked at you to see that. And, but um, it's really hard to actually make that happen grassroots. And it did in this case. So um, the, the, the three in the front, uh, Jesse and Sinjan and Adam, are from, um, from Brain on the Magenta team. And the, but Sander was a crucial, um, crucial contributor from DeepMind. And then all, all the last ones are manager types like me right now, so in this paper at least. And um, <clears throat> we have a couple of blog postings. Um, if you want something to follow up on later, please have a look at magenta.tensorflow.org. Um, there's a, a number of blog postings talking about all of this work, including the drawing. And we keep putting more and more up there. It also provides links to the uh, um, GitHub and everything else. Um, so this work relies upon previously published work from DeepMind. All credit to DeepMind on this. Um, a model called WaveNet. Anybody here familiar already with, with WaveNet? A few people? OK. Um, basic idea is that this is a, um, a model that is predicting the raw waveform, which um, I come from a tradition 
that strongly believes this is crazy. <laughs> I think hopefully some of us in the room share that intuition that like, what are you doing? Um, it's not, not going to work. But um, this model actually showed that with uh, a lot of engineering and um, a lot of electricity on GPUs, um, you can actually train a model, a convolutional model, to predict the next sample um, for audio that's sampled at 16,000 hertz. So um, that's predicting the position of a speaker cone in a way. I mean, it's crazy. Um, and uh, what makes this model able to function is that it, it, it's fundamentally a, a, a model called um, Pixel CNN, a Pixel Convolutional Neural Network that was already published, and they renamed it when they, they pushed it onto audio. Um, but the idea is that it is, um, it's doing convolution at the level of the waveform, so at the level of the sample. But of course, if you're doing um, gradient descent with 16,000 units, eventually your gradient just kind of vanishes to zero. There's just no signal left. So instead, they're doing something that existed already before called dilated convolution. So different layers are actually skipping samples and also being informed by lower layers. So you'll have layers in the network that are skipping many, many samples, maybe 1,000 samples, but they're also being fed by um, some sort of um, neural network representation of what happened in between, all to condition the next sample, which could be, uh, I think the most best performing was the delta of the, of the, of the, um, uh, of the previous sample, and also mu law encoded so that you have more dynamic range for, um, um, <clears throat> for the, um, what matters, you know, it's logarithmic compression. So anyway, this works really well. However, it has one um, really crucial problem which shouldn't surprise you if you understand roughly how this works, which is that it's completely incoherent beyond the, uh, say, you know, 200 to 500 millisecond range. It's interesting, it can grab chunks, it kind of stays coherent for a while, then it just decoheres and, 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 and basically becomes unconditional and continues generating. So to make that more concrete, this is what it's like to train a um, wave net only on Dizzy Gillespie music, right? Only on Dizzy Gillespie and then generate from it or not. This is gonna, it's gonna be great, I promise. Let's see. Okay, did you guys get that? Uh, Miles Davis. like miles on the radio, like you're tuning the radio, right? Um, and then um, we trained a model. Our goal was to create a, um, a music synthesizer that lives in a latent space. So I mean, that's the basic goal of Ensent. So if you, I, I like starting with the drawings first, because you can see how you can do conditional generation on, on these drawings. And you can, you can explore the spaces that live between what we know about in the real world, so to speak. That's a little dreamy, that's a little bit poetic, but like, you know, I draw some drawings and I project them and I can, I can linearly interpolate in, in uh, this vector space and get something new. Um, when we tried to train, we built a large data set of musical notes, independent, individual musical notes, just, you know, like every lab eventually does this. We did this back at University of Montreal. I've got an idea. I'm gonna make a huge data set by sampling lots of stuff from a bunch of sample packs and from, you know, like whatever. And so we did that too. And then when we trained on it, if you sample unconditionally, this is not a conditional model. You really only can sample unconditionally from these models. This is what you get. Here's just like one sample from a wave net trained on uh, individual musical notes. Right. Sort of held a pitch for a little while, and when it decoheres, it just decohered to some other super low frequency thing, right? Um, here's another one. This one's really pretty, actually. Notice how the, it, it, it lost its pitch coherence, and then it sort of shifted down to another pitch, but then it found the harmonics for that other pitch. So it's learning, these WaveNet models are actually learning a bunch of, um, using convolution, a bunch of you know, Fourier-like features, lots of papers out from lots of labs that analyze this basic behavior, lots of wonderful discussion about whether you'd rather fight with um, generating by understanding how to put phase back into spectrograms or whether you should just do this in the first place. I don't, and it's, it's, it's almost like a religious battle now, so. Um, I'm just going to talk about what we did. Um, what we did was we said, well, let's take advantage of WaveNet, but let's condition it. Let's condition it in a way that makes sense. So now um, we have a very similar picture. We have some input and some output, and we're going to try to build some sort of 
um, some sort of autoencoder. In this case, our encoder is going to be doing <coughs> deep dilated convolutions itself, okay? And trying to pool across those convolutions to build some sort of temporal view of what's happening in that audio. By temporal, I mean instead of having one Z that's big enough to try to understand the entire musical note, okay, we're going to have a bunch of them that, that um, move in an autoregressive fashion over time so that we have this small temporal representation. Then what we'll do is we'll use that to condition our WaveNet decoder. And one thing I didn't copy in, which is to just make the graph simpler, is that this WaveNet also has the, its own state. So it's, when it's trained, it's seeing the, the waveform itself. Fundamentally, it's receiving the information from nSynth as a conditioning and only as a conditioning. It could choose to ignore it if it wasn't useful. Um, another way to view this is um, using these spectrogram-like um, representations that we called rainbow grams. And there, time is still the horizontal axis and frequency is still the vertical axis down here and up here. These are the embeddings themselves in the middle. Um, the color here is just to tell them apart. These are the rainbow grams. The, 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 color, the color is just is, is a mapping of phase. So if the color stays the same, that means that the phase has been coherent at that frequency for a long time. So you see modulation really clearly in these. And that's the only thing they add. Somebody must have. We looked around for someone else that used color to represent phase in a spectrogram, right? Doesn't seem like a crazy thing to do if, if you care about things like modulation, but we couldn't find anything, so we slapped a name on it, and we spent five minutes trying to explain what the hell we're doing because it's weird. But it does give you kind of a nice view of, um, um, especially when you compare to spectral models um, as baselines, um, we see that these time domain models actually can do a really nice job of capturing some of the some of the modulation that you hear in some musical instruments, which is maybe of it's in our paper. You this group especially might find some of those. Uh, details interesting. Here what you're seeing is that um, these are the embeddings. So each of these, it's only a 16-dimensional vector that unfolds over time in an autoregressive fashion. And you're just seeing each one of those 16 dimensions as a time, as a, as a time series. So what you can think of is that you know, this sound was learned by the wave net and when reconstructed became this sound, but it benefited from, from this conditioning. Okay? Um, it also means, by the way, in future models, if we can figure out ways to generate these, then we can generate whatever we want to, because the WaveNet's learned to rely on this, and that's kind of cool. We can also like artificially extend these if we want to, so we can generate like four-minute-long flugelhorn drones if we want to burn up a lot of electricity, um, things like that. So there's a bunch of stuff we can do with this, um, both artistically and um, in terms of research, to play around with what's possible now that we have this sort of temporal autoregressive latent space. Um, most importantly, what this does is um, allow us to generalize from points that, um, that we have in the real world. So here, um, picture a sound is worth a thousand words. Here's a, one of the bass samples from the data set. Sounds like a bass. And here's the WaveNet reconstruction. It's not perfect. It's certainly not as good as, like, there's tons of ways in which you can generate bass sounds that are better than this, but this still has its advantages that are elsewhere. So let's listen to this. Definitely missing uh, a lot of the harmonics and missing the, the attack. But OK, we can fix that later, maybe. Here's flute. Here's our reconstruction of flute. Where we see something interesting happening is um, certainly everybody in this room, in your mind's eye, you should be able to predict what happens when you um, do a linear interpolation of flute and bass in audio, you get the superposition of flute and bass, right? right? But now, the take home, I think, on this model is that now imagine in this latent space, we take these temporal vectors for flute and for bass, and we literally interpolate in that space, OK? So now um, we get something that sounds fused. Including a little bit of warbliness at the end. Let's listen to that again. Oops. Right. And so where we think that the expressive power of something like this lies is in an ability to really explore these spaces um, for which we don't have obvious analogs in audio, right? Um, here's a flute plus organ uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in audio. 
I mean, I can hear them, right? They're, they're not really fused. Um, and then here's flute plus organ in um, WaveNet, or in uh, Ansem. And organ plus bass in the interest of time. Did you hear that, that little high harmonic at the end? Um, there's a couple of ways in which you can play with this. Um, one of them is with a, um, a web demo, which contains some samples and linear interpolations between the samples. Um, it's available if you just Google for SoundMaker, you can find it. And you can take this slider and slide between, actually, I, how am I doing? Yeah, I can do this. It's kind of cool. It's better just to do it. Let's do a reload. So I'm just going to do one that's like shows really clearly what's going on. Here's a cow. And now it's, the volume's different here, isn't it? So you can hear the original sample. Here's a piccolo. And here's the reconstruct. Not, so if you click on these, you hear the original samples. If you play down here or with a keyboard, this is our reconstruction of the piccolo. Ideally, I mean, obviously, you don't come here because you want the most perfect reconstruction of a piccolo. Go get yourself a piccolo. <coughs> and then we can move over and kind of linearly combine. And we'll have some relatively ill-behaved spaces in the middle. But as we move closer, here's our cow reconstruction. And uh, forgive the AI experiments, guys. They wanted to come up with fun samples, right? Um, but you notice it's basically built at the cow sound and sort of obviously these harmonic bases that it learned because it was trained on music, right? Um, and you can play for hours with this and listen to some of the intermediate spaces. What, what I found um, most interesting about this is not this demo, which is cool. I think it's really cool. But we also have, um, on our GitHub, we have an Ableton plugin that has many, many more samples. And that's, I think, musically more fun to play with. And even then, like, this really is a first step. Like, we, we have to... We have to do all the linear interpolations offline because it's so slow to generate, even with like hundreds of GPUs. So I think the real power in this is for us to find ways in which we can generate it in real time and have a latent space that we can control in real time. I think then we really have something. In the meantime, it's um, really great to, to, to experiment with what we have now. Um, <clears throat> also, there's a kind of cool data set. If you, um, it, you know, if, and I, I think probably, Given all the other data sets, the fun would be to link this to others, um, especially given free sound. But it's not bad. It's like 300,000 um, synthesized or drawn from sample pack um, sounds with um, different instrument families available and then some, some qualities. So um, especially you guys here, if you see ways to link this in with the work in free sound, we're, like, we're not like trying to present this as this thing that everybody has to use, just another data set to throw out there. It'd be much more fun to find ways to, to have overlap. You know? We just built it. Um, and now I'm going to talk about sketch art. And no, I'm not. I already talked about that. See? I jumped through all these. Um, so um, it, questions? It's like, you know, sometimes people interrupt. It's totally fine. All right. Yeah? Oh, two. Good. Oh, you were in the back first. Um, just curious, your original demo about mild, uh, yeah. mild music. Uh, you said train on mild, but like early mild, late mild. <laughs> I think it was all the miles that like, he was like searching for. <laughs> he was searching for like. It sounded like early miles, didn't it? Yeah. Um, no, I think I honestly uh, th these were done by, like just for demos by Sinjin and, and Sander, and I think it was just like they grabbed some miles. I could find out. I do agree. It sounds like early miles, so I guess probably is. I didn't hear like bitches brew or you know anything like you know. I guess that might's almost early too. Other questions? What I meant was uh, that for every one of these audio samples, um, it's not nowhere near real time to generate them. So we had to pre-generate all the wave files. And so fundamentally, what's in this Ableton plugin is a sample pack. Right. What's interesting is that we can visualize and the user can see, OK, I'm starting with this sound and I'm going to this sound. And we've done tons of linear interpolations between instrument pairs. So it's just, I mean, in some sense, doing a grid search over a model and like exhaustively generating is not, it's not new. It's just, 
I wish we could do this in real time, at least on a, like a fast machine, and we can't. I mean, it's not even close. It's like, you know, 100x real time. I mean, it's, you know, it's, and the wave net, it, it is what it is, right? Like you're doing this conditional inference of every sample. <laughs> no matter how many corners you cut, you know, there, you're still doing a lot of inference to make that next sample. I think so. I mean, I'm always surprised. I didn't think this model could be trained in the first place. And the, uh, there, um, there's a lot of work going on. Because WaveNet is so important for text-to-speech, um, you know, there's a lot of work going on in making it faster. Myself and almost everybody else who's looked at WaveNet is convinced that we don't need to do all of this inference. It's just a question, <laughs> you know, it's like the, the, that movie Amadeus from the 80s, too many notes. It's like, which notes do you get rid of, right? Um, maybe that's, a old, that's a, like an American old joke that doesn't fly here. Um, the, you know, we, like this chain of inference that's being done to generate the next sample is, is massive. And it seems clear to me that we don't need all of that. And with the right representation and the right priors, we can do something else. So if one, obvious, one obvious thing to try is to make the model conditioned on some set of bases that it learns that are like some reasonable set of bases, um, you know, some sinusoidal set of bases. So that when you drive the model and condition it, you're driving it with something you can compute really fast over the thing you want to condition on. Like, you know, what, what are the main sinusoidal components? And then force WaveNet to pick up on all the residuals that you can't handle and pick up on the nonlinearities. So these are the kind of ideas that just need to be tried, right? And since these models are so hard to train, um, you know, it's just like that horrible, you know, it's the black art of machine learning, right? You know, you just have to like do a lot of TensorFlow or Theano or PyTorch and you've got to have a lot of GPU time sitting around to do it. But, but it's doable. Yeah, sure. In the current example, you have the free of noise. Yeah. That's, that's for the drawing. We don't, we, we're not worried about overfitting in WaveNet. This, this is not a problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right. So this was, this was treated as a hyperparameter in the model. And then op basically just looking at being able to train the weights without overfitting on out of sample data. So it was kind of a, it was kind of a general machine learning approach. Um, um, he, you know, injecting noise into some layer in a neural network is a pretty standard thing to do. And, and David did that. And that, all that work was done by David Hawk. But I think it's, you know, fundamentally, you overfit so fast, right? You're playing capacity against overfitting. As long as you're doing good machine learning, you're saying, all right, how much noise do I generate such that I get, I don't get overfitting and I can still generate, pick up on both the KL divergence loss and the, and the, the L2 loss. Um, how much time do I have? Yeah, okay, so I wanna, I'm gonna actually grab a different, I think there's another more important thing to point to here. Um, I was gonna mention, uh, where's my sample? There it is. So we have a number of, um, I'm going to switch from audio and switch from strokes to, to musical scores and, and music. And um, there's a paper, there's a, we have a couple of what we did. And so let me back up. Especially with respect to music sequence generation, which is something I worked on like embarrassingly long ago, like 2000 to 2003 with LSTM when I was a postdoc with Jürgen Schmidhuber trying to get neural networks to make it, you know. My postdoc was um, like 50,000 lines of like crappy C++ code implementing LSTM one more time. And then, you know, you want to try something different. And, you know, so thank goodness you all have things like TensorFlow and Theano and, and PyTorch. It makes life easier. My whole postdoc is like 20 lines of, 20 lines of TensorFlow code, which is really sad. Um, the, um, but there's these issues of representation, I think, remain, re remain probably the most um, important future direction for caring about generative models that artists might actually want to use and musicians. So, I mean, it's a question of, it's a question of what question are you, are, are you asking and what solution are you looking for? I mean, you know, we have WaveNet down here and NSYNTH caring about the waveform. We have any number of, of great intermediate representations for audio that we could play with. You know, we, we obviously have piano roll and we have scores that we want to care about. And, and, you know, I think that we've shown that the same thing is true in the visual domain by simply having some stroke-based data to train on instead of pixels. We're able to, to really try some different things. Um, I wanted to summarize a bit. Um, well, first, it, there are two papers that if I had infinite time, I would talk about. One of them is um, actually generating musical scores non-causally, so treating the score as basically an image and then a piano roll image and then infilling bits of the image and then resynthesizing re from that using, you know, turning it back into MIDI. 
Um, there have been a number of groups that have had great luck with that. There was BokBot, um, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, we had a paper called Coconut, which was by Anna Wang. Um, and she did some nice four-part harmonizations of Bach. And it turns out unconditional generation from the network sounded more like Bach than Bach to untrained users, which makes me sad for untrained users, because it didn't sound that great to me. Um, here, I'm going to show you a couple of new things. Um, we started, the first thing that we did in Magenta, just to get the ball rolling, was like the simplest recurrent neural network, trained on all the MIDI data and melodies we could get a hold of. Um, and, you know, we're able to generate kind of, kind of a melody. This, was, this is the melody right here. Oh, why did it? One of many, but this one ended up being grabbed by some reporter. Um, so I think, you know, there are, there are mountains of papers, and there are, you know, at least a half a dozen different ways in which you can do this with varying degrees of success, generate new melodies. So you might, um, and I think interestingly, a lot, of, a lot of the real cool questions come from how do you actually take the score or take a piano roll and treat it um, with a machine learning model. In that particular model, we chose to do um, uniform, uh, even you know, sampling, sampling of the piano roll. So to generate a whole note, if you're, if you're sampling 16 times per measure, actually requires 16 successful predictions, which is kind of silly. Um, and that was um, not the right approach. Um, there have been other approaches before and after. Uh, Andrew Kapathy ha has a character RNN net that uh, Bob Sturm used, where uh, duration is ex explicitly encoded. I think that's a better way to work. Um, what we've recently done, and I mean recently like this week, we haven't even figured out how well this works, is um, actually try to put time back into these networks in a really um, to, to allow for expressive timing and dynamics, and also to allow for polyphonic um, generation. So um, I wanted to play a couple samples for you. This one, my purpose for this is actually use your ears to think, all right, what are you getting by adding these sort of, these dimensions to the data? Now what the model's doing is it has, um, it has, its output is a bunch, it's just this huge softmax representation, which is um, pitch or advance the clock. And it can advance the clock by um, basically at the millisecond level. So the model can do polyphony by continuing to just generate more pitches. And it can advance the clock by deciding to advance the clock. And it also decides when to turn off those pitches. So it's a pretty granular representation of what's going on. It's basically node on, node off, and advance the clock. And um, so with this, what we get is a little bit, and oh, and we trained only on um, real, like lots of piano performances that came both from like scraping the web and pulling together things like the, the, the Yamaha data set and, and measuring for whether there's any expressive timing so we don't just have scores. And now I think this advanced the clock representation actually gives us what sounds to me like a little bit more fluid timing and you know, interesting polyphony, this relatively raw representation. Let's listen to one version of this. Now let's listen to it again and try to, try to find the pulse. And I think what you'll find is that the model hasn't really gotten the timing. So there's, it doesn't have that really robotic grid-like sound to it. But it also, I don't think this model was trained long enough or had the right data to actually feel, I don't feel like it's shaping phrases the right way. But anyway, I think it's, I want you to hear that it's not, that the, the timing is definitely not uniform. So that, I think that's still 
not bad for unconditional generation, right? Like it's, it's reasonably good. I'd like to verify these models are not terribly overfitting. So that's, I'm, put, put a kind of a, wait for the paper um, before you say you love these. And then here's, now this model's trained, this model's a slightly different model. It's trained with velocity as well. And in this case, it's, it's another unconditional generation. As far as I know, trained on the same data. Again, these were emailed to me just a couple days ago. And, um, but listen for, it's not over the top, but I think you'll hear, you, you really pick up a whole other level of expressivity by having the model trying to pick up on even, you know, even, even relative velocities in, uh, in the piano. Still wandering, right? There's no, there's no, no there there, but um, I think I don't know. Could you hear the? Could you hear a little bit of? It shows up in the MIDI. I mean, it's definitely there. It's a question of whether you respond to it. Um, so the way to bring all of this together, um, I think, is a nice challenge. We have, we're still living with um, uh, kind of where we're sitting in that representation hierarchy. Some stuff happening at audio. Some stuff happening in musical scores. And I think, like the rest of the community, no obvious way to bring all of this together. Um, there's the more Bach, the Bach. I wanted to get to a couple conclusion slides here. Um, yeah, I want to leave uh, 10 minutes, or 10 minutes at least, for questions. Um, but I hope this gives you a rough idea of what we're trying to do. Um, you know, really what we're trying to do is publish papers. And um, we have the, the um, ability to, to do that. We're also trying, if, if, it, if it helps understand the PR, I know we've done a lot of PR. Like, you, you guys are probably sick of seeing Magenta, especially if you're trying to do this stuff yourself. But we're, we're trying to engage a, a, a community and we're actually trying to build out a kind of connection between artists and musicians. And the, the door is absolutely open for collaboration. Um, I, I really don't, I really, the, the success here is seeing machine learning move into the arts and into music. That's what success is. Like, we're not, um, you know, we're not um, really that interested in products. This is really just a part of Google Brain, and I, I went to, um, I went to the guy that runs Google Brain, Jeff Dean. I'm like, hey, you know, what about generating media? Shouldn't we do that too? And kind of, made, he's like, yeah, sure, let's try this out. And then the second thought was, well, shouldn't this be open source? Isn't it kind of silly for like four or five people in Mountain View to try to tackle art and music? I was like, yeah, we should make it open source. And that's sort of what we did. So that's where we are right now. Um, would really love to see um, collaboration with you guys. I have like huge respect for this group. You um, are one of the first and one of the, the best groups. All the, the PhDs that have graduated um, already, I just know a bunch of people all over, right? I mean, lots of people out in Silicon Valley too, but when I was at University of Montreal and working with uh, McGill and, and Kermit and now at Karma and at Stanford, you guys are awesome. So um, if anything about this talk made you interested in collaborating or writing some code, please you know, contact us, contact me directly, and, and we can talk more. Um, I want to close with this quote because I think um, it, it hints at where, where, we, where we all want to be with technology and art. And I, I just love it so much, I always read it. Whatever you now find weird, ugly, uncomfortable, and nasty about a new medium will surely become its signature. CD distortion, the jitteriness, jitteriness of digital video, the crap sound of 8-bit, the distorted guitar sound is the sound of something too loud for the medium supposed to carry it. That's Brian Eno, who I hear is here this week. So I mean, I think that hints at this idea of trying really hard to understand how we can take these models, right? but actually do something interesting with them and, and actually maybe move, move us into a place where we're actually um, spawning a new kind of, of art and a new kind of, of music. And um, you know, time will tell if that will happen. If not, we'll be left with some papers and we'll have moved forward signal processing and machine learning a little bit, right? But maybe we'll be as cool as you know, Rickenbacker and actually do something like build a, an electric guitar for, for the next generation. And if any of you work in instrument building, you know like, that's just like, insanely hard, right? Whether you're using computation or not. But you know, that's what we're doing. And um, I thank you for your attention, especially with Sonar to distract you. And uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. Questions? Oh, good question. You know, I can, I can probably have. If you do, do you know TensorFlow? 
Um, I've used it. But okay. I mean, we're not secretive. It's as fast as we can get it out. I mean, Ian, uh, Ian Simon did it, and we've just been trying different ways to handle time, you know, without things exploding. By the way, it's it's really hard to do regression. Softmax works better than regression in almost every case. The WaveNet stuff is actually doing Softmax. So if you're not familiar with Softmax, so just like picking one out of many possible answers. So you're basically saying I'm going to bin time, and then I'm going to pick the winner, as opposed to trying to regress onto the milliseconds. So he finally got, I think, kind of the right resolution. It might not be enough so that like, there's a bunch of potential clock advancement values um, at the millisecond level. Um, so basically what I'm saying is we've been playing around with different things, and we're, we're going to write it up, and we'll do an archive paper, and then we'll put out some code. And then we'll figure out if it's overfitting right. We have to figure that out first. Because these, these, to be really honest, like, these sound pretty good to me, like I, like that, especially that last one. And then I, I, you know, we're not trying. You know, we're machine learning researchers. You may have heard overfitting. We don't know yet. I just thought they're, the timing is real. So it's fun to hear the timing variances, and it's fun to hear the, the velocity variances. Whether these, how far these were away from instances of training data, time will tell. Like quickly, like this week, <laughs> that kind of time. And it just that's that's actually really nice. We already have a lot of that code written. We have the call and response code. Like we know how to shuttle data to and from a TensorFlow model, and we can now do it in JavaScript, and we can do it in like a, a Jupyter notebook, and we can do it in Ableton. So now it's a question of like getting that right interaction mode, which which by the way is like so hard. It's just so hard to get that right. Um, We've really struggled to get that interaction mode right, um, and have found that we've basically built one-off interaction modes for different musicians because every musician kind of wants something different. Unfortunately, we haven't figured out that the guitar pedal of of this, you know, that just kind of works. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I love the arithmetic you did with the sketches. Uh -huh. Can you add Bach? Yeah. You know. So I think um, I think if we can um, if we can come up, what we need is a latent space representation. We need a conditioned latent space representation of what we're generating. And right now, what we have is an autoregressive model. So that state is really hard to control. It's basically the the recurrent state of the neural network. I think if we could move to convolutional models and then have a latent space representation of what we're trying to generate. Basically, like what we might consider doing is something almost exactly like nsynth, but for musical scores, right? Because just take that same strided, uh, dilated convolution idea down to to, to, score, to the score level, right? Then I think we could do exactly that, right? We would have these really nice, relatively low dimensional time series that are there for generating Aphex Twin, right? And then we could play around. Um, I just totally love to see that. Um, um, it's hard, but yeah, it's possible. Yeah. And I guess you are aware of all this work on cognitive reading, learning, intrinsic motivation. We are at Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know this, uh, yeah. What is truly the people and model? Yeah. Is it also something that you try to apply at Google for generating artistic content or? No, I think I, th I think we just haven't gotten there yet. So we we at we chose I. I I, actually, I chose with Magenta to do something, which is to say, we're going to make Magenta part of TensorFlow. So the, open, the GitHub is TensorFlow Magenta. We're part of TensorFlow. And we're also making the decision that we're going to see how far we can get with deep learning and reinforcement learning. And, and that's not to say that that's the only way to solve this problem. In fact, just the inverse. It's to say that there are so many ways to solve this problem. If you're going to make any, any headway, you'd probably better pick something, right? Otherwise, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, we're a group of five people that are going to solve art. I think that's, it's already pretty naive to be a group of five people trying to solve, you know, doing what we're doing. So there's a ton of stuff we're ignoring. Um, we're ignoring a lot of stuff having to do with higher level structure and um, yeah, Jürgen's, the intrinsic motivation stuff. Um, I think we've, we owe a lot to Jürgen for um, having said a lot of really interesting things about the uh, uh, interplay between, or the connections between with, uh, with uh, encoding and entropy and compression and how that relates to what art is. So it's definitely um, a thread going back to there. Um, but that's as far as we've taken it. That's not to say it's not important, just, you know, it's got to cut somewhere. Yeah? From the work I have, my specific question, but I, I 
was really interested to see, and perhaps not so surprised to see when you released the third set of the quick draw stuff. Um, and so to me, I mean, it makes complete sense once you saw it, but certainly there was nothing, when quick draw was first released, there was nothing that said, uh, we're going to keep all of your recordings, right, and right. eventually we're going to release the third set. So here's what we did. I, I checked, I double checked on this. We, we changed the quick draw released, and we decided we wanted to collect the data. And we actually changed the web page to say, and we'd like to, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna use your data to improve machine learning models. And we threw away all the data that came before that. Okay. So we only stored the data that people, where there was a very clear message, hey, we're gonna use this to try to build better machine learning models. Which I guess is, you know, what else kinda can you do, right? Um, certainly it wasn't, like, we, <laughs> we actually really care about user trust at Google. Like, there's a running kind of joke inside of Google that if you, if you really want to get fired at Google, right, just go try to read someone's Gmail. You know what I mean? Like, like you will be fired at Google for doing any kind of like personal violation of, of trust. And we actually have to go through all sorts of hoops. For example, to give you a concrete example, I used to run personalization and, and, and uh, recommendations for Play Music, right, which is one Google product. And we have YouTube sitting over here, which knows a lot about music, right? Now that we've finally merged these products right now. But, and like you'd think, okay, maybe I want to know what users are doing with music in YouTube. And it, it's just an insane amount of work to get permission to be able to analyze. And it's already in the terms of service. It was just like there's just all this internal control. So if it helps people, we, we really do try hard. And there was no question about throwing away the data that came before those changes in the, in, in the, in the warning. And we've, we were asked about that many times. Right, it's, right. It's, a, it's, a, it's a totally reasonable question. In fact, I asked. I'm like, wait a minute. How are we going to use this data? It was, it was one of those things when I first saw that it was released. So mm -hmm. Right. Sure. Yeah, and do what we did, right? Like turn it around. Yeah. Well, there's this great game, but actually the goal wasn't to give you a game. The goal was to collect the data. It wasn't though. So the, the the idea to collect the data came later, right. which is why we changed the wording right. on the web page. You know. Other questions? Yeah. I do have That's fine. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Because it seems like, I don't know, with a sketch, RNN stuff, you can start to say model automation. Um, yeah. With WaveNet, you can model like samples. Um, and then also you'll get into the movie stage. But yeah. it's then, how long will it be until you can just sort of generate like a, um, an Ableton project, like fully, <laughs> like well formed, just from scratch? Right. Um, yeah, we're putting together the building blocks for that. Um, we have a pretty cool 808. Um, the 808 is really fun, and uh, the uh, I think that that's a really cool project to work on. I I don't know that we have the right people on our team internally to do that. Uh, there are people externally that want to do it. If you're interested in doing that, you know, be happy to work with you. Um, actually, Jesse, the, the first author on the um, on the um, Ensynth paper, is pretty hardcore Ableton. But I think we'd want to partner with Ableton. We'd want to understand like, how to actually generate proper Ableton projects. We'd want to have some way to get like, a really cool thing would be to build out. So here's what I want to do, if you want to help. I'd love to build out a project where, especially if you focus on one thing like Ableton, like, hey, give us your Ableton projects knowing that we're going to train on them and try to build new Ableton projects. Right? Like, just make people part of the experiment. And then ideally, give them something back. Like, like let them let them sort of overfit on their own project or something. Like you know, like give people something. Like here, you know, you give us your Ableton project, and what we'll do is we'll give you back a version of your Ableton project that we think is either worse or better, but at least machine learning has added something. And you're like, you know, you can just keep throwing your projects at it. And at the same time, we start to collect a bunch of them and train on it, and and everybody wins because people are like, hey, that's cool. I helped train this big, you know, project. I think it'd be really fun to do. Yeah. Arguably better to do in collaboration with with um, with a group like this than just Google alone because it's just you know, it's, there's a number of like great grad student projects living there, right? Um, yeah. About a year ago, I started trying to tackle this, and I was totally out of my depth. <laughs> yeah. but, um, I managed to get um, some like few kind of better transitions, like some big data sets of project files. Um, so it's definitely like people are willing to so give. Maybe we can chat about it offline. I'd be curious to know more about what you did. So I guess we should uh, be finishing. Uh, so, like, some of us have to go back to. Yeah.
thank you very much again. Um, of course, thanks for your attention. Thanks for all your questions too. That's great. I'm hanging out a little bit if people want to chat more.